Welcome to PowerCat Live. I'm here with my fellow PowerCat, Kent Weir, Principal Program Manager Lead on PowerCat. And you've seen him on Build-A-Bot, Automated, and his own YouTube channel. Hey, Kent. Hey, Phil. How's it going? It's going all right. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Doing well. Thank you. So before we get into talking about what you're going to talk about today, tell us uh, just, you know, how long have you been in PowerCat and kind of what was your journey to getting onto the team? Uh, okay, so I've been with the team just over a year, I guess a year and a couple months. Uh, so I'm leading the sort of emerging technologies area inside of PowerCat. So really focused on Power Automates and our RPA investments, and then also our conversational chatbot service, Power Virtual Agents as well. And so uh, it's been a great journey, learning a lot, working with a, a lot of strategic, large customers. And uh, it's been a lot of fun thus far as well. And so you're going to talk about robotic process automation today, right? One of those emerging technologies you just mentioned. Uh, it seems like robotic process automation or RPA is taking off right now. Like, you know, why now? What's happening right now to cause this? So RPA is, is certainly nothing new from an industry perspective. Uh, it has been around for, for years. I think what's been really exciting is, you know, Microsoft's take on RPA and robotic process automation and just, I would say, automation in general. And so we're no, we're not new to automation, right? We've had Power Automate for a few years, and Logic mm -hmm. Apps, and BizTalk, and SSIS, and a lot of these other things. Way back, yeah, <laughs> that go ahead and help you with automation itself. I think what's different about us compared to some of the other folks in the industry is just our ability to democratize who can go ahead and build mm -hmm. out these experiences, right? So what was often seen as kind of like a pro dev or like a centralized IT function has now been democratized and we're able to bring more people to that party in order to build out automation itself. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of interest is because our tools are quite approachable. And certainly when you think of the existing reach of the Power Platform, we're now able to service those people with use cases that they may not have even thought about because there were some other barriers in the past for them to get access to those tools. Today, we're going to talk about the Center of Excellence, and we often talk about the, the Center of Excellence Starter Kit for Managing Power Platform, but you're going to talk more generically about the concept of a Center of Excellence, especially around RPA. Talk about the importance of, of having a Center of Excellence for RPA. What is, what, why is it so important? Yeah, no, so it makes, it makes sense. Like when we think about automation and, and especially RPA, like we're, we're typically going after like high value use cases. And so whenever you have a lot of high value use cases, naturally you do need rigor that aligns to the goals from that perspective as well. And so people naturally have concerns about, you know, mission critical automations and like, how is it being governed and how are you taking advantage of the security models what is the integrity of the data? How do I know if this is working? How do I know if this is failing? And so there was a great analogy that I ran into recently is when you have bots that perhaps aren't working, it's kind of like having your workforce, you know, standing outside, um, yeah. you know, waiting to get into the building because like they're not working. Like when you have automation, it's, it's typically doing the tasks that a human would normally do. But yeah. if your bot's not available, then what does that mean to the business process? And I think people generally have a lot of concerns about that. A lot of it's just you know fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Mm -hmm. And you want to have some tooling in place and processes in place to give people that comfort to know that, hey, when I set this up, it's going to run, it's going to be reliable, and it's going to be something I can depend on because I know that the business is depending upon those outcomes. Now, if, if an organization is just getting started with RPA, just exploring it, is there a risk to getting started without having a center of excellence already in place? I think there's some balance, right? You do want to understand what you're getting into. Um, and I think it really comes down to like, what are the different models that you want to align to? I don't think there's a, a one size fits all here. There's definitely an element of like, how much do I want to democratize? How much do I want to take on as, say, like an IT function or a centralized function? And trying to find what is the right balance and the right patterns from that perspective. You know, I would say that there's some, some base things that you should always be thinking about, um, you know, as an organization. Definitely leveraging some sort of templates where you do enforce some level of consistency. So things like error handling or, say, instrumentation, if you want to be able to, like, log specific types of data. And then maybe there's some reusable components that you want to include. Maybe it's a custom connector. Or maybe it's some sort of like shared desktop functionality to ensure that everyone isn't sort of recreating the wheel. And I think that should be a goal is to have some level of consistency because you don't want, it's going to be very difficult to measure it if everyone's sort of doing their own thing. 
And I think that's definitely one of the roles of the COE is to, to put in some of those building blocks so that you can have some consistency and you, so that you can go ahead and benefit, like track those benefits, benefits realization. Because if everyone's doing their own thing, how do you sort of tie this all together? And how do you report up saying, hey, we've spent X money on RPA and we know exactly what are the tangible right. outcomes from that perspective. So it is important to, to think through this a little bit. And I think the, the balance is not you know, imposing too much control um, that yeah. people have, can't actually get things done versus having it too loose. And then it's like, I don't know where this is going, right? And so that's naturally a bad place to be. So it's trying to find that balance from that perspective. And some of what you just described, uh, templatization, error handling, and those sort of things, those are what we'd normally see in a power platform center of excellence. Or is the RPA center of excellence usually aligned with the power platform or do you often see them as separate? Uh, so I think there's definitely some overlap. Like there's some common assets. There's some common, you know, I'd say foundational sort of ideas behind them. I mm -hmm. think perhaps maybe that level of detail that they get to is where things start to differ a little bit. Uh, for example, like you might have a, an app, a power app that you're going to be, you know, monitoring, you know, through the, the center of excellence starter kit and you want to understand like who's using it and how is it being used and sort of where is it deployed and where are those users, those are things that are fairly common, right? From mm -hmm. an inventory perspective, I want to understand what's out there. I want to understand who's created it. I want to understand what's using it on the RPA side of things. It gets a little bit interesting because if you think about mm -hmm. automating a process, how you go ahead and capture those benefits is oftentimes through the number of times it was actually run. So if I have a process that say, let's keep things simple, like every time it runs, it saves say $100 worth of labor. Um, so if I want to be able to calculate the overall benefit for that specific process being automated, I need to know how many times it's run. I need to know how many times it's failed because mm. that could have a business impact. Maybe every time it fails, I lose a thousand bucks, right? So you need to be able to track it at a much sort of more granular level. And um, that's where we are working uh, collectively as a PowerCat team to sort of bring, bring some additional investments to help COEs that want to be able to get down to that lower level of detail and how we can then roll all of this back up to say, hey, I started with this innovation backlog idea, I've captured the idea, I've captured my benefits. Now, how do I go ahead and link that to the execution, the runtime execution to say, okay, I know that in this month that uh, this particular automated process brought this much value to the business. And this is one of the sort of called the key underpinnings of an RPA COE is to be able to sort of link from like idea generation to outcome and to be able to do that in a very repeatable manner without a heavy lift. No one wants to go collect a whole bunch of logs at the end of the month and say, hey, we've yeah. got this you know, report we have to send upwards. It's like, no, no, like this just needs to happen automatically for me and I should have you know, data available to, be, available to me in a timely manner so that it just is auto updated and I can go ahead and uh, you know, filter and sort of roll up and sort of break apart depending upon the makeup of my organization. And for all that automation, it'd be a shame to create all this manual work just to measure it. Right? Exactly. It'd be tragic. Yeah, there'd be, yeah, there'd be a mystery somewhere. <laughs> sure. So uh, there's different versions of implementing a center of excellence. What are some of the models you've seen work from real customers? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll quickly just run through just a, a few of them that we have here. I think there's, you know, some things to think about is there is no one size fits all. It really comes down to, I'd say, like the size of your organization sort of your current experience with RPA, with automation, even with Power Platform itself. And then naturally you're gonna have some industry specific requirements as well. Like there might be you know, data that's sensitive. So you do need to sort of find a balance here. But in general, here's a, a few of the different scenarios we've seen. In this case, that was, would be perhaps a smaller implementation uh, where you've got some partnership between say business units or your citizen developers and perhaps an existing IT group that's responsible for managing Microsoft 365 or the Power Platform itself. And that would be considered their own COE. And, you know, that group's really going to be focused on providing the base platform, you know, ensuring that you've got environments, you've got machines that you can use, you've got mm -hmm. DLP policies to avoid data loss from that perspective. But citizen developers really have a lot of autonomy in terms of how they go ahead and build out their solutions. And they're naturally accountable for the outcomes of their bots. They're accountable for the uptake and to ensure that they're running. And it's really more of a, a partnership between your existing COEs or IT groups and citizen developers. 
Now, the flip side is you're, you're essentially got this balance or the spectrum of like control versus agility. Hmm. And so this is where you as an organization need to figure out, like, where do you want to be on that spectrum? Because um, it is you're, you're typically it's a trade off. Like, I'm going to trust my users to go do something. And in return, I naturally have less control. Now, there are ways you can gain back that control. And we'll see that in sort of our, our next model. Now, this is probably what you've seen, you know, traditionally in, you know, existing RPA automation, COEs, and, you know, it tends to be more of a centralized function where you've got a RPA CO team that's going to provide a lot of those templates, do code reviews, um, provide automation for deployment, manage machines. You still have this role of, you know, an M365 or Power Platform COE that's providing the base platform. And then you've got more of a group of centralized, you know, developers, oftentimes referred to as pro developers, that go ahead and build bots through the entire lifecycle. And that RPA COE there is really there to help them scale, but to do it within sort of, you know, a specific framework that they they must adhere to. And so naturally here, if we think about control versus agility, citizen developers, you know, they've got very little agility in this case. It's it's more of a centralized function. And so as a result, you might have very tight control, um, but you're probably not going to be able to scale this because you've got a smaller audience that can go build out these solutions itself. Now, in some you know industries, this might be sort of ideal due to the nature of the data and whatnot, or the complexity involved. But the the trade off is you're you're not going to be able to decentralize from that perspective. Now, another model here, and this um, you know is uh, some work that we've done with uh, another customer, and they've created a program called Bot Wars, which they have on on their blog that you can go ahead and refer to. And and here, what's happening is we've got this idea of like democratizing building out these specific solutions, right? By giving business units the autonomy to go ahead and build out mm-hmm. their solutions, be accountable for the outcomes, but still being able to fall in line with some you know, general sort of guidelines or principles um, in order to go ahead and build that. And how do you go ahead and provide self-service automation from that perspective in order to go ahead and sort of help that scale. And here, you know, you've got a fair amount of agility because you've got autonomy, but you know, you still have a fair amount of control as well. And through automation, you've really um, basically enabled it from that perspective. And then I'd say like the most comprehensive model we have, and this would be, you know, typically for larger organizations, where you do have this blend of both citizen and RPA developers that are all sort of working underneath the same framework itself. And the RPA COE is, is largely there to help scale. And so as a result, you end up building, you know, making you know significant investments in tooling in the framework. Um, but the whole idea is that you can sort of achieve that balance of control and agility because you've gone ahead and built out so much of that underlying framework for people to go ahead and to use. And I would say the goal here is really being able to track from like that idea being generated all the way to some sort of like operational reporting and analytics on the back end that allows you to go from like beginning, you know, of, of benefits, identifying benefits to benefits realization. And by having a very sort of cohesive framework involved, you can actually go ahead and follow those breadcrumbs and be able to do that in a highly automated fashion. And so I think this is probably one of the sort of more mature um, but obviously, there's some you know investment that needs to take place for this to happen. So it becomes a balance of sort of as an organization, where do you want to be? But I think the good news here is that you know, as you can see from all of these icons on this on the screen, is that we do have a lot of these building blocks in place, and it just becomes a matter of like, how do you go ahead and assemble them so that it addresses the needs of your organization itself? And I imagine a model like that last one we're looking at is something that took years to evolve to along that progression. It, so, yeah. Well, I'd say, yeah, like I think the, the goal is, uh, I think for f- some organizations to get to this point, yes. But I think the goal here going forward is that, uh, you know, through investments that we're making from a Microsoft perspective, is how do we sort of bring that down to like, you know, weeks? How do we get sort of a COE set up in weeks um, or less um, and still have this level of sophistication? And that's really where, you know, PowerCat is, is focused on here is how do we start to bring some of these tools to the forefront so that people can sort of uh, like learn from sort of our, you know, experiences Mm -hmm. and naturally reduce the cycles involved for them to get to that point. So if someone is in that position and they're ready to get started with the RPA center of excellence, where do they get started? So we do have uh, 
basically a, a framework called Heat Holistic mm -hmm. Enterprise Automation Techniques. Uh, it's something that the Power Automate Cat team has been focused on. And we take you essentially through this automation journey. And we've got a lot of the content in place where you can go ahead and see what are exactly the things that I should be thinking about. It could be things like service accounts. It could be environments. It could be ALM. It could be about like, you know, tracking business exceptions, things of that nature. And so we'll go through that, give you pointers, give you examples of that. And then certainly, certainly over the Next coming months, we're going to be providing more of this in tool formats that you'll be able to just go ahead and download and then use inside of your environment to help you scale your automation at your organization. That's great. It's a lot of, a lot of value there and also winning the acronym game. So it's a double win. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks, Ken, for covering all this. There's, there's a lot of experience in these center of excellence models. And so I, I know there's a lot of folks that are going to be looking at how do they get started with RPA. And, and this is a great jump start. Thanks for taking the time to show it to us. Yeah, thanks for having me.